And this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, as promised, it is a 2022 draft redo, redraft with Leaf Tulane. Stay tuned to find out who Leaf has in his top five, his top 10. We're going to cover the lottery today. I'm looking forward to hearing who Leaf has in a redraft. So stay tuned. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board. And my co-host for the day is Leaf Tulane, who I think is going to be a star in this industry. If he's not a star already, and this episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. That is last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. And the star that I mentioned, Leaf Tulane. Leaf, what is going on in your world? It is twelve forty-four a.m. Central Time in my world, and I am operating on fumes. Uh, I'm feeling good. I got I got to play some tennis and played some basketball, so I'm 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 in a good spirits and ready to ready to kind of shock some people with my takes. But I feel good. I spent I spent the better part of yesterday and today building this list and got some got some takes that I think are not scalding hot, but but warm. They're sitting on the on the heater, and and I think people uh, will have fun listening to this. So I, I need the stats for your game tonight. Triple double. What, what type of performance uh, it, it, did you it was give just us? it was just pick up today uh the last game was a good one i had a, a game winning hook shot which you know went, went down to the the post i was a little taller than the guy guarding me even though i'm a point guard and put in a nice little float like floating jump hook and you know led the team to a couple victories in a row to end so that, i was pretty happy with that are we talking like kareem sky hook or magic johnson game winning sky hook or the steve nash baby uh, hook? I'd say closer to in between Magic and and, and Steve. Like you know, I, I don't have the 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 sky hook in my arsenal. I was on the I was on the right block or I guess the left block face back into the basket, kind of faked to the baseline, went to the the jump hook about ten feet, nothing but nut, and it was it was pretty pure. I was happy with that. It was twenty eight twenty six final game. Uh, do you do you walk off the court talking trash? Like, I mean, are you like kind of like Draymond leaving <laughs> leaving the nah. arena yesterday? So someone's gotta someone's gotta get me pissed off to get me talking trash. And I was I was just hanging with some buddies and we played some pretty competitive ball today, so I was happy. See, I'm a trash talker. Yeah, I'm I may not be talking to you directly, but I'm talking to my teammates about you. Ask ask Richard Stamen. He he played a little pickup with me and uh yeah, just like to like to uh, you know <laughs> talk a little trash, but it's it's all in fun. All right, let's let's just get right into it. Let's to your top fourteen picks in the twenty twenty two redraft. All right, number one, who will be the number one pick in a redraft? No surprises here. I got Paolo Bancaro, who was my number one entering the year. Uh, he was my assumed rookie of the year, and he and he will be the rookie of the year. Uh, he he to me is exactly what you're trying to draft in a in a transcendent player for a franchise. Like he changes the course of your franchise's trajectory. And he was able to do that from day one with a dominant debut and really carry the, that momentum the entire season. People can nitpick his efficiency and three point shooting, but he like that. Those are easy things for him to improve. Like he needs to improve his outside shooting, but he has all the physicality in the world, the ability to create space, impact the game in multiple ways, pass, score, rebound, defend. And I think he's the obvious answer for the number one pick. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I had him number one a good chunk of last season, but it was after the Gonzaga versus Duke game. I, I came into the season with Chet number one, but after that, I was like, there's there's no way anybody's better than, than Ben Carroll in this class. All right, number two. This is where it can get a little interesting. Uh, already, we're already in potential hot take or warm take mode. So who's number two? I think this is one that will get some pushback, but I but I have confidence. I'm taking the aforementioned Chet Holmgren at number two. Is I, it I, just because it's the unknown? And uh, no, I think I, I saw him playing summer league, and I know that's a very different beast. But I was really really impressed with what he was able to do there, and I thought he was the clear cut number two prospect in the draft last year. 
Um, so I have nothing to change my opinion for to the negative on that that take coming into the year. I, I had Paolo one by a little bit over Chet, and then I had Chet number two by a clear bit over whoever who's number three. I don't want to spoil it. Um, you know who my three was, but uh, I I I think that there's nothing that's been done to surpass him, and he's done nothing to lower his stock for me. Um, injury was unfortunate, and I really like how he's going to fit in with the th- this Thunder core who really developed rapidly, and I think he'll put them to a next year next year. What do you think his role is going to be next season? I think he can play the role that Jalen Williams from Arkansas played, except get more touches offensively. Like he can space the floor, be a pick and pop five, and I think he can score more. So that opens up the floor even more so for Shea Gilgis, Alexander, uh, Josh, Giddy. I think Giddy and Chet will be a very fun pick and roll combination, and Shea's ability to get pressure at the – on the nail and, and uh, Chet's ability to both roll and pop, I think will really flourish in OKC. Do you think uh, Chet and Williams will play together? Chet and Arkansas, Jalen Williams, do you think they'll start together? I think they can. I don't think they will start together. Um, I'd, I'd imagine that they'll play Chet and with Dort, Jalen Williams from Santa Clara, Giddy, and Shea. But I think they're they're going to play minutes together. I just don't think they'll start together. Okay. All right. Numero three. It's kind of like I'm gonna, Spanish English there, but I'm going with Jaden Ivey. So for those of you who followed me last year's draft, this is my exact top three coming into the draft. And you can say, oh, confirmation bias. I don't think so. I think Ivy had was put in a rough situation where he had to grow rapidly and he really didn't stumble too much and a really poor team, the best player, Kate Cunningham, the guy who was the face of the franchise probably still is the face of the franchise goes down. He's out for the year. And now it's, uh, it's Jaden Ivy and Jalen Duran show and Jaden Ivy really excelled in that role. Um, especially in the last month of the season where he, he was pretty phenomenal. People knocked his three point shooting. He that got a lot better. He was 34% on the year improved dramatically throughout the year. 16 points a game, five boards, four and a half assists. I was really impressed with him as a rookie, and I think he'll continue to grow. Yeah, you mentioned a key stat yesterday, and you mentioned that Jaden Ivey had a better three-point percentage than Benedict Matherin, who got off to a sizzling, sizzling start. So that, I mean, we'll talk about Matherin at, 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 at later on in the show, but that's a shocking stat that I don't think most people would will uh who would get if you asked them to bet which one had the higher three point percentage. All right, number four. Number four, I am torn between two college teammates, but I'll explain my logic as to why I'm going with Jabari Smith Jr. over Walker Kessler for four. Jabari Smith Jr. got off to a uh, kind of strenuous start where he was playing my turn, your turn with teammates, and the coach admits, hey, we're not drawing up plays for him because he you know he can just make an impact without it. That's not exactly the role that a number three pick typically finds himself in. And that's what Jabari Smith found himself in. But at the end of the year, Jabari averaged 15.2 points, 7.6 rebounds, 1.4 assists in in his final 21 games of the season, shooting 47% from the field and 36% from three. And he played great defense at the end. Like that Houston team wasn't good as a team defensively. But individually, if you watch his game film, I was impressed with his versatility, which he was billed as having, and he and he showed that in spades towards the end of the year, learning how to defend multiple positions and stretching the court. And I think the the value of him over a guy like Walker Kessler, who was the better rookie, is that he can can play multiple positions and centers. I think the role of of the drop coverage makes centers a little more uh, replaceable. Like I was having this conversation with a good friend of mine today. Say Derek Lively were to replace Walker Kessler and be 75% of him, and, and that's a big drop-off, 75% as opposed to 100%. That's not the most enormous drop-off, whereas when you get a guy like Jabari Smith who's got the capacity to play center but also play power forward and score, that's a skill set that I think leads to more uh, chances to win on more teams. And so that's what I'll bank on for Jabari Smith because this is teamless when we're when we're drafting this in a redraft. All right, and let's round off the top five with uh, Walker Kessler. Walker Kessler, I, I talked about him yesterday. I've talked about him numerous times as a Jazz fan and someone who worked with the team. Uh, he he had an instant impact. Like he was able to impact the game from day one. And the reason that Jared Vanderbilt and uh, Malik Beasley and Mike Conley, Mike Conley, a little bit different here in this in this situation, but Vanderbilt had to go 
because they needed minutes for Walker Kessler. He was just burdening at the door, and you were like, man, I have to play him because he, he's so impactful when he's in. So an insert Walker Kessler and plays with Lowry Markin and Kelly Olynyk, and he's an awesome defender, a guy who's probably going to receive votes uh, I mean, as a defensive player of the year candidate, like he, he was that good at times. And and soon he'll be really a guy who threatens for that drop coverage. He, he impacts the shot chart. People don't shoot layups around him. And, and he's also able to offensively contribute. And he scored nine points a game as a rookie, which, you know, it seems pedestrian, but when you're playing limited minutes at the start of the year, and then you're thrust into the starting role and you're the defensive anchor for a team that wasn't very good defensively. But when he was in, it was so much better. Like statistically, the splits were enormously skewed in favor of Walker Kessler's defensive uh, prowess and the lineups that played him as opposed to the ones without him. Um, I I really value that. And I think people that haven't watched the Jazz as much, if you watch some Walker Kessler, I think you'll kind of come away with the, the same takeaway. What do you think his numbers will be next season what type of jump would you predict that he's going to make uh i can see him being a double double guy i, I could see maybe 12 13 points 10 boards yeah i know he led all rookies in 2010 games this year so that is very doable all right the ultimate pro basketball gm is the coolest game that's i mean it's just the coolest game in a long time i've always thought i could be a great nba gm and is as it turns out, it is not all that easy. And if you've had the same thought and you have fantasized about managing your own basketball franchise, go and download the Ultimate Pro Basketball GM right now. The game allows you to manage every strategic aspect of a franchise from playing through seasons and leading your franchise and the fans to glory as you build a historic dynasty and the simulation you are responsible for dealing with the challenging personalities from the coaches, the players, Hiring the right coaches and assistants, trading and training players, making draft picks, navigating your franchise through free agency and the draft and all the ups and downs that come with managing a team over multiple seasons. All this is challenging and realistic in a game. The Ultimate Pro Basketball GM is completely free and it is playable offline, play on the go, play as you want and when you want to. And you as a Locked On listener, you will get a 100% free boost to your franchise when you use when you use the promo code Locked On in the game store. So make sure you check it out. To download the game, just visit probasketballgm.com. Scan the code or look it up in the app store, probasketballgm.com, Ultimate Basketball GM. Start your dynasty today. Big, big shout out. out. To you, the listener, and thank you for making the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. And if you are an everyday listener, tomorrow on the show, Leaf will be back, and he's going to give his 2022 NBA Draft recap, picks 15 through 30. All right. We left off at number five with Walker Kessler. Who is number six on your 2022 redraft? Number six is where it gets really interesting for me. I feel like there's a divide between five, and it's not enormous, but I, there's a couple players from six through eight that I really – I have a list in front of me, and I think as I'm looking at it, I'm going to change it. So <laughs> here's my – I'm battling with my own mind, and maybe this will be aligning with more of you guys or, or certainly less of you. I'm going to go with Shaden Sharp at number six. Uh, I had him number eight on here, but the more I thought about it, the more I was wanted to move him up. I bank on guys – if I'm drafting – and this is, once again, like teamless. If I'm drafting a, a guy at number six in the draft, I want the chance that they can really change my franchise's trajectory in the positive direction and be that guy that I can count as a number one option. Shaden Sharp averaged 18 points, 4.7 rebounds, uh, 18.3 points, 4.7 rebounds, 3.2 assists in his final 15 games. And he came out of high school. Like, I know that he had... Uh, Kentucky, and he attended a few practices, but effectively he hadn't played N uh, basketball games in a, in a year, and he went straight in the NBA, and now he's scoring 18 a game for a month and a quarter. Um, like, sign me up for that. Like, those flashes were unbelievable. Uh, I think I saw him in person twice, and if he just refines some of that just raw talent, like, he, there was multiple times he tried to dunk on Walker Kessler, who's a tower up there, and he gets way above and if he just, you know, drew the foul, that yeah, had a couple points a game. If he if he refines his jump shot and creation ability, and he's got so many good mentors in Damian Lillard and Anthony Simons, who took a similar jump that I'm expecting Shaden Sharp to take, I, I really think he's a guy that will, when the redrafts are done and further from where we are currently, 
that he'll ascend from where he was picked. He was picked seventh in the actual draft, and I think he'll go higher than that when we redraft this draft in five, ten years. Quick question. Where does he go if he stays in the 2023 class? That's a probably, tough question somebody mentioned prob- to me. And I have probably to five. Me. So you think he goes five? So top you would five, take top five, yeah. So you would you think there's a chance like Amon Thompson would go ahead of him and and if twenty twenty three, if he's in twenty twenty three? I think there's a chance. Amon Thompson's such a sensational athlete and a better passer than Shane Sharp, but but yeah, I think it's I think he's at anywhere from three through five. Okay. All right. So number seven. Number seven, I'm going to go with Jalen Duran. Uh, I think he's someone that is not counted on as having as good of a year as as he really had in terms of impact. Once again, playing on a poor team in the Pistons, really thrust him into limelight and has uh, really developed an ability to impact the game on both ends. He scored nine points and, and grabbed nine rebounds. He's a vacuum defensive rebounding. He's a good defender. He was the youngest player in the NBA this past year and established himself as the true front court piece, along with the multiple lottery pick front court that they've uh, they've got there in Detroit. And I think he's really been the ascending star. I talked on draft night and we had the same takeaway that the Pistons won the draft. And if you're doing a redraft right now, having two in the top seven, is certainly indicative of doing so. And at 13, I thought he was the steal of the draft and, and my favorite pick of the entire draft. So, I'm still singing that tune, and I think he's going to have a great year, especially when he gets his true point guard back in Cade Cunningham. I can't believe he fell to 13. Do you think the Knicks regret it? Like he was a, It was their pick that they traded, right? Yeah. I could not believe it. We, we were on a stream, and I was just texting Richard Stamen the whole time. I was like, if Duran isn't picked here, I will lose my mind. And then he, they trade the pick, and I'm like, well, they better take Duran. And then the Hornets uh, had a chance as well, and they got Mark Williams, who also will be good. But I couldn't believe that people were passing on a talent that I had. I had him number six in my uh, my big board, and he's number six here. And I, I think I just couldn't believe that you're going to pass an 18-year-old who was able to impact games highly at college and then does, steps in the NBA and does so at the exact same level, and he's only going to get better as the skills progress. I agree. So we're at number – so he was number seven. He was seven, yes. Sorry, right. I misspoke there. So, so, number eight, there's a guy that seems to be sliding. Number eight is Jalen Williams for me. Uh, this is the Santa Clara Jalen Williams. Okay. And I think he is uh, – he was the steal of the draft where he was picked, he, he along with Jalen Duran, and he had better counting stats than Duran. But I think I value the position that Jalen Duran's in in Detroit and the fact that he was so young – that he, if he's 18 years old, this productive, I think he can be better than what Jalen Williams was at 21 in a better winning culture, even though they were young. Uh, they had a better supporting cast. And uh, this that's not to take away anything from Jalen Williams. I just think that's the rationale as for Duran over Williams. Williams is a guy that impressed me all year long with his creation ability um, and his cutting off ball, on ball. He can impact the game there. Defensively, he is a pest. He is a terror. He uses his wingspan to full effect. And I think he'll be a longtime stalwart wing player for the Oklahoma City Thunder. And any team that were in a redraft would be looking, would be fortunate to get a guy who can score 15, 17 points a game uh, and be a top tier defender. Okay. All right. Number nine. Number nine. And this is where it starts to get a little, little dicey. But for me, this is Jeremy Sohan. I think he's drafted at the same spot he was selected by the Spurs. We talked about it last night when when we elected him, or I guess I elected him, but I think you concurred uh, in the second team. All rookie. He just he's a guy that has a distinct flair for the game. He scores, but he impacts the game more as a passer and defender. And I think he's only getting better and embracing his role like he does is really valuable. He reminds me a little bit of a more defensively minded Boris Diaw. And I think that's really perfect for today's modern game with versatility and switchability being emphasized. Yeah. And yesterday you casually just threw in a Jeremy Sohan, Victor Wembanyama front court. Uh, I had to ask you like, do, do you know something that we don't know? <laughs> because you just, it was so casual how you just dropped it in. You didn't even say potentially, possibly, 
in fairness, I was responding to a prompt for those of you who are listening to this out of context. All right. All right, number 10. Uh, Benedict Matherin. He, he started off, like you said, a sizzling start, really was one of the few rookies that you saw a defined role right away. Like within the first five games, you're like, man, this is what Matherin's going to do for this team. He played with very good guards. Uh, I think he'll at some point be a 20 point per game scorer in this league, but I think his defense was lacking his three point shooting. As I mentioned in yesterday's podcast and you alluded to today was suffered a little bit. And I think he's a better shooter than those percentages. He shot 32% this year. Um, But I, I don't think his impact defensively and on winning were as high as some of these people ahead of him, despite counting stats being in his favor. And I, I could see him making a jump up these rankings later in the career, but the way that, that I value this is who can who can really make a dent and, and and contribute to any championships, whichever situation you want them. So at the top, I'm taking guys that are, you know, the guys that change your franchise and make it possible for you winning championships. And once you get to these second and third tiers, I want guys that are supplementary pieces. And I see him as a supplementary scoring piece, but he's not quite there defensively as a two-way wing. So at this point, I see him more as a fifth starter, sixth man, extraordinaire scorer. And I want, and some of the players ahead of him were more complete, in my opinion. Yeah, this is the second consecutive season, obviously first in the NBA and, and, and second year in a row, that I feel like the shooting numbers, like he's a better shooter than the numbers indicate. But <laughs> it's two years in a row. Like, like I said, thirty what you thirty two percent from three. Thirty two percent from three. I don't remember the numbers last year, but I think he was thirty six point five percent from three last year, if I remember correctly. But in the half court, the numbers were significantly lower. It was like he his three point percentage was heavily influenced by like transition threes, if I'm not mistaken. It was something some yeah. weird stat that I remember that him and Chet they uh, off the catch in, in the half court. Their numbers were were surprisingly low, but their percentage was like heavily weighed in, in transition. All right, when we return, we'll finish out the last four picks. But let's talk about Game Time. And Game Time is the app where you can buy tickets to your favorite event without it being stressful. Game Time is fast and easy, and it allows you to buy tickets for all of the sports, music, comedy, and theater shows near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over tickets and start getting hyped for the fun that you will have because Game Time has flash deals on last-minute tickets. Easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. You get images of the seats, and they have a lowest price guarantee, event cancellation protection, and job loss protection. So if you get fired from your job for playing too much Ultimate GM and you bought some tickets on Game Time, you get it back. I'm just guessing here. So forget planning months in advance. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the last day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. And the game time guarantee means you always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. That's how confident they are. Get images of your seats before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. And you can buy the tickets in a matter of seconds. Two taps, and you are set. And the tickets are sent directly to your phone so you do not have to dig through your email to find the tickets. So all you have to do is download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off. Download game time today for last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, last segment, four picks left. I feel like the top 10 is pretty solid. I think there's a significant drop off at, I guess, maybe number number 12. And the top 10 in your redraft looks a little different than your all rookie team that was posted yesterday with uh shade and sharp and jabari are the two guys that i think didn't make those make those teams all right so who is number 11 i think i have an idea here but who's number 11 
uh, you, I think you've got a 50-50 chance on who it is. There's one player that slipped a bit, and this guy that I'm actually taking at 11 is being is higher than where he was picked in the actual draft, and I'm going with Tari Eason at number 11. Uh, oh. Tari Eason, to me, is a guy that was on a terrible team but made the most positive impact on that team. I'm not saying he's the best player, but he, like, it, there's there's a strong, strong argument that if you were to base this off one year, Tari Easton was better than Jabari Smith. And Jabari Smith, you want to have the chances as your number three pick. You, I, the reason he's higher on my th- on my board is because I believe in his offense developing more, and he was good defensively. Well, Tari Easton was better defensively. Offensively, he made things happen, whether it was a wrecking ball or not. Uh, that doesn't matter. He still made things happen. I think if you put him on a, in a winning situation, he's a key contributor defensively. He can really guard multiple positions. He can cause transition, which is very valuable in the grit and grind, to quote the Grizzlies, kind of that that is the playoffs. I want someone with the dynamic athleticism and playmaking ability from sudden like sudden situations that Tari Eason possesses. And, and I think eventually he'll show the world what he can do in that situation because he is – truly one of the more rare athletes in the NBA. Uh, there's very few pl- people with a build like him, like the prototypes Kawhi Leonard with uh, that are like six, seven, six, eight, long arms, big hands. And he, he, OG Ananobi, uh, Patrick Williams, those type of players are pretty rare. And I, I really believe in that archetype of player. I maintain it. And I said it months ago in a fair and open training camp where there's no politics involved Tari Easton is the Houston Rockets starter at the four spot. If this was like Europe, and I, I always go back to comparing things to Europe where there's no lottery, there's no reward for losing, and the worst team is in jeopardy of being demoted to another division, second division. If the Rockets needed to win to stay out of being demoted to the G League, I think Tari Easton would play more minutes. That's just my opinion. Uh, I I agree. All right, number 12. Number 12, and this is the end of the slide for who I believe you thought this last pick was going to be, and that's Keegan Murray. Yes, uh, yes. Keegan <laughs> Murray was a first-team all-rookie guy in my last uh, last episode, and he was deserving of it. He played significant starter minutes for a team that is the number three seed in the West and is up 2-0 over the defending champions. I think the shortcomings he possesses and the reason that I'm a little lower on him in the long run are some of the same reasons he's not playing minutes right now. And that's a little unfair to him because he is one of these rare rookies that is playing playoff basketball. I think that as good a shooter as he was this year, 41.2%, uh, his lack of athleticism in terms of burst is, is causing him to be on the bench because they need a defensive stopper. And that's situational because Davion Mitchell is one of the better def- guard defenders that can guard a player like Steph Curry, or at least hope to. And then you have Malik Monk and Kevin Herter, and that's the same situation. I think there's a little more dynamism in athleticism between those other players. And I think he can be phased out of the game and his upside is limited. He's a, he's got an extremely high floor and we saw that all year. But I think, like I mentioned, in terms of playoff basketball, you got to play a role. And he will be able to do that. But there are guys that I think can tip the scales of winning playoff games more so in this draft class that I counted ahead of him. His defense was supposed to be one of his stronger attributes because he was a good rim protector. He has the strength to defend bigger guys. And now you feel like it's he's a liability on the defensive end? I don't know if I'd go a liability. I think situational basketball in this case dictates that that Davion Mitchell has to play more. Yep. Um, I, I was not as high defensively on him as many. Uh, I, I thought that the Big Ten is the least athletic conference in college basketball. And so when he... Like, like looked, period or just out of the power fives? Uh, the power six, yes. Power six, okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, that was that's a good clarification. Um. But I, I think that because he was playing in that conference, it made him look more above average athletically to me. And I, and I thought when he played against competition that had similar to better athletes, he was fine offensively, but defensively didn't look as sharp to me. Okay. All right. Number 13. Number 13 is a guy I, I remain extremely high on and could end up higher in, the, in a redraft in a couple of years. And that's Jaden Hardy. 
Uh, he was on the bench behind do- ball dominant guards and some of the most heliocentric players in basketball, aka Luka Doncic for the entire year and part of the year Kyrie Irving. But Jaden Hardy just knows how to put the basketball in the hoop, and there is a place for that. Uh, even if he were not to exceed this this archetype of player, Jordan Clarkson is a hot commodity in playoff basketball because you need someone to score when the game's tight, yep. and I think he can follow that uh, mold of player, be a sixth man. I also believe he can be a starting shooting guard and play kind of a combo guard. And if he were in this draft, I think he'd go higher than where – I know he'd go higher than where he was selected at 37th, which was a travesty. I thought that was the, the, the most ridiculous slip of the entire draft. Yeah. And I, I really believe that if he were to go in, in this upcoming draft, he'd be a lottery pick again and be regarded more like Keontae George. And we've talked about this numerous times. If he played college basketball, he'd be a top-five pick last year. It's just that he'd shot poorly compared to – NBA, former NBA pros, McDonald All-Americans, and grown men in the G League, and he was a victim of playing basketball rather than hiding, and uh, I, I think that that'll change in the future. I think evaluations will get better on G League, shooting splits being you know viewed as such a negative. Yeah, and I could take a, a step further. If Jason Kidd plays him more this season, he's higher. I mean, he was playing behind Frank Nilekina the majority of the season, and he was only really given a fair opportunity when they had no choice but to play him. And <laughs> I just think that the way a kid handled Jaden Hardy is one of the reasons why Dallas fans, not necessarily management, why Dallas fans have him on the hot seat. Like I saw a vote where the, so I forgot, it was maybe like DallasBasketball.com or Mavs Moneyball. One of the two did a vote about who should stay between Jason Kidd and Nico Harrison. And Kidd was like the overwhelming, I don't want to say favorite, but he, the majority of the people wanted Kidd out of town. All right, last one, number 14. This is an interesting one. I don't think people would see coming. He was drafted around this spot in uh, in the prior draft, but I'm going with Mark Williams. Mark Williams wasn't playing much at all and Which then I don't at understand. the end of the year i have no but idea yeah it was silly was uh but at the end of the year he was given an opportunity and thrived in his opportunity and i like this archetype of player someone who can has a defined role protects the rim plays good defense rebounds the basketball and adds supplementary scoring even if that's not a starter in playoff basketball which i believe he can be and probably will be um that that's a valuable role as a backup and so to me that that's a type of player that produces winning and so i believe he'll be a starting five on a playoff team eventually and that's more than a lot of these people can say like if you go back to redrafts i was listening to some redrafts podcasts just because i'm a nerd and there's some drafts where you get to number eight and they're like well how many playoff series did he win and the answer is zero and he scored like 15 empty calorie points a game and they're like well we have to go with production well to me i'd rather someone that scores you know 10 points gets eight rebounds plays stellar defense and wins a couple postseason series and I think Mark Williams can be a really big contributing factor for that. Mark Williams had averaged 11 points, uh, nine rebounds, and one and a half blocks per game in his last 20 games of the year. And that's when he was finally given an opportunity on a poor team. And it's not like he's being set up for these things. I also have the privilege of going to games and, and watching warmups. And I was pretty struck by his touch. He can shoot the ball. And I think that's something that will be developed. It's not going to be his skill set, his strong suit that keeps him in the league. That's his defense, but it's a supplementary skill that I really think will be useful in the long run to combine with his already impressive array of skills on the defensive end. I agree. I I talked to a, I don't even want to call him a scout. He's a coach for a team. He's on a different team this year, but he was basically the guy that worked Mark Williams out when Williams was doing his pre-draft workouts. And he mentioned that Williams was the most impressive guy that his team had in their range. And he says, Mark Williams is going to be able to shoot the three within the next two years. And I remember tweeting it and people were kind of like, no way, you know, there's no way, yada, yada, yada. But I'm, I'm glad someone else sees it. And I, I've seen a few other people mention that they were impressed by his touch and his shooting range. So once he gets the green light, then can you imagine Mark Williams as a a floor spacer? Like 
he becomes really valuable if he is a guy that can knock down open shots and protect the rim. I mean, those guys have extreme value. Absolutely. It's all about additive value to the teams. He's not a franchise player, but he's a guy that is a starter on a playoff basketball team. And I think you're taking him at 14, empty context. That's a that's a slam dunk. And Charlotte knew they were going nowhere as soon as Miles Bridges, that situation. And then once LaMelo got hurt, in my opinion, they should have known right, this team is not going anywhere this season. Let's give Mark Williams. Just turn this into a huge developmental year. And I think they dropped the ball on that. Well, you know, we, we agree a lot. So, yeah. it, but this is a no brainer. I think everyone should agree with this. Well, thank you for dropping off your first 14. And thank you, the listener, for making Locked On NBA Big Board your first listen every day. So, every day or tomorrow on the show, Leaf returns with. 15 through 30 in a redraft and i know that has to be tough i think the first 14 is easy may not be super easy it takes some thought into it but 15 through 30 can be tough because there's there's some guys that are going to be in your redraft that did not get any minutes well that wraps it up this is rafael barlow leaf tulane and we are out